Good evening. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's virtual public program, Traumas and Triumphs, a roundtable on the history of Black childhood. We're joining you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Programs at the Society, and I'd like to start by briefly introducing the American Antiquarian Society, a national research library and learned society in Worcester, Massachusetts. We collect, preserve, and share materials printed or produced before 1900 in what is now the United States, portions of Canada, and the Caribbean. Our collections, which are housed on some 25 miles of shelving, include newspapers and periodicals, books and pamphlets, graphic arts materials, children's literature, and manuscripts. AAS supports and welcomes scholars and readers from around the country and around the world to our reading room or to seek digitized materials via our website. We also offer regular programming like tonight's virtual program, and we will be welcoming visitors back to our building for hybrid programs starting next week. I invite you to return to join us for upcoming programming throughout the year. You can go to our website for continual updates, including series such as Women Make History, Nature and the Environment, Book Talks, and Perspectives from the Collections. As a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help keep all of our work going, and we thank you for that. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Zoom, my colleague Amanda Kondek will be sharing a few notes in the chat about how to use the Zoom webinar function. She will be posting links there as well as relevant information uh, throughout the program. Now to open the chat, just click on the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen. And I would like to remind you that the program is being recorded and it will be made available on our website and our YouTube channel uh, within the next few weeks. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for this evening. Crystal Lynn Webster is Assistant Professor of History at the University of British Columbia. Her book, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, African-American Children in the Antebellum North, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2021. Webster is currently writing her second book, Condemned, How America's First Courts and Prisons Terrorized Black Children. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and in Black Perspectives. Cabria Baumgartner is the Dean's Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies and the Associate Director of Public History at Northeastern University. She is the author of the award-winning book, In Pursuit of Knowledge, Black Women and Educational Activism in Antebellum America, published by New York University Press in 2019. Her public writing has been featured in the Washington Post and Historic New England Magazine. She is currently a National Endowment for the Humanities Long-Term Fellow at the American Antiquarian Society. She's working on a new book project, Revolutionizing the City, Black Youth, and the Struggle for Civil Rights in Boston. Nazira Wright is an Associate Professor of English at the University of Kentucky. Her book, Black Girlhood in the 19th Century, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2016 and won the 2018 Children's Literature Association's Honor Book Award for Outstanding Book of Literary Criticism. Nazira is just concluding a National Endowment for the Humanities Long-Term Fellowship at the American Antiquarian Society, which is allowing her to move forward with her next book project, Early African-American Women Writers and Their Libraries. Our format for this evening will be for each of the panelists to present for about 10 minutes on their work that will be followed by conversation amongst the three moderated by Nazira, and that will be followed by questions from you, our audience. So I will now pass the baton to Crystal Webster. Thank you, Nan, for that introduction. I'm so pleased to be here virtually with the American Antiquarian Society and with my colleagues. I have really fond memories of doing um, a really formative seminar at the Antiquarian Society. So I'm joining you tonight from Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm grateful to be a guest on this land and it is land that is the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. 
indeed what we call North America is native land and colonial empires were built on the backs of kidnapped and enslaved Africans. And as a historian and a black woman, I also want us to um, reckon with difficult histories and products of white supremacy and settler colonialism, especially in this particular moment in light of attacks on history, critical race theory and black and indigenous life. And if you're interested in learning more about where you live and work, you can visit, visit native-land.ca or in getting involved in anti-racist activism, the Global Black Lives Matter Network. So I want to first talk a little bit about um, how I came to this second project, Condemned. Um, and I'll be sharing just a little bit about this project by focusing on the story of Hannah Okuish. And this really was born out of the work and research of my first book, Beyond the Boundaries of Childhood, which was published in June, 2021. Um, this book takes on the phenomenon of Northern emancipation and gradual emancipation and black children's indenture and experience in reform institutions. And most importantly, this book was child-centered and um, attempted to construct the world of Northern life from the perspective of black children. For this project, I discovered the shocking presence and treatment of black children in America's first prisons, which led me to this project Condemned. Condemned is a book about the origins of the American justice system from the perspective of the children, the population that suffered the most injustice. It reveals how extreme, tragic, and cruel convictions of Black children in early America were not anomalies, but instead served the foundation of the US criminal justice system. And this story begins with the story of Hannah Okuish, who is the youngest person ever executed in the United States at age 12 in 1786 in Connecticut. So I'm not going to go into details of the case. And um, I'm going to tell a bit about Hannah using um, a child-centered framework. And just to give us a sense of what the power of the work of doing historical research on Black children is and how it really challenges our understanding of crim criminal punishment in early America, as well as reveals the limitations of the historical archive. In my telling of Hannah's story, I choose to focus on the events leading up to the execution in order to imagine her experience and not to replicate the event itself. And this challenges the dehumanization and the voyeurist aspects um, that can come with the reproduction of suffering of Black people and of Black children. So I imagine play and joy in an archive which attempts to rob Black children of these histories. And with this approach, I'm influenced by scholars like Sadia Hartman and her method of critical fabulation um, in which she reconstructs the voices and lives and experiences, in particular, the quote, in, intimate dimensions of Black life in order to reveal the rich landscape of Black social life. I'm also influenced by scholars like Christina Sharp and her concept of Black redaction and annotation, as well as um, Cydia Hartman's examination of Black violence, in which she argues that um, Black violence continually becomes reproduced in ways that immure us to the pain and virtue of their familiarity. So this is really profoundly the case for Hannah who suffered so much violence at such a young age. And the process of finding her voice is incredibly difficult as much of the record of Hannah's story and child or story and trial rather come from this sermon shown here, which was performed by a preacher, Henry Channing at her execution. The sermon is highly sensational and so I engage it, but I engage it critically alongside with um, an engagement of different types of reconstructing her narrative, including space, geography, and movement.
1786, in the ten Connecticut town of Norwich, an 11-year-old Black and Indigenous child named Hannah remained crouched inside a cell in the jail of the center of the town screen. And this is an image of the map of the town in Connecticut of, from a bit later, but gives us a sense of the geography. And as she listened to the sounds of the bustling city beyond the walls around her, she constructed an entire world inside of her mind. When she heard people gathering at the meeting house, she imagined the merchants, the officials, and everyday people who would determine the rules for the residents of the city, some of whom had brought her there. She made up stories of the passerbys to the post office, where and to whom they were mailing letters and the faraway places those letters would travel. Just outside the walls of the jail, there were stores, children scurrying to school and even music. And she imagined herself as part of it all, going to festivals, scurrying to school, singing along, dancing and disappearing into the inner workings of the New England world. Hannah did not personally know any of these outsiders, yet she felt somehow well acquainted with their lives. She'd been jailed for months now, enough time to make many observations and to compose many stories. And in truth, her own hometown, New London, never quite felt like home, and Norwich was not much different. She always felt isolated as a Black and Indigenous child in the Revolutionary era. But she was not entirely alone. She had friends and on one day they came to visit. She rejoiced at the sight of the other children who talked, laughed and played with her inside of her jail cell. To them, the jail barrier was only one physical boundary which attempted to divide them. The children had grown familiar with forces which at any moment might separate them from their family and friends, forces of war, slavery, indenture, abuse, and now criminal punishment. Her friends were willing to see past the bars and the restrictive space. They'd done it before and they would do it again. As Hannah and the children played, they imagined and enacted liberation from confinement. Two seasons earlier, Hannah's world was violently upended. One summer morning, the body of a six-year-old white girl was discovered dead in New London, Connecticut. The next day, a group of outraged residents gathered and searched the town for the 11-year-old girl. Court officials, a judge, and her own neighbors hunted her down. Once they found Hannah, they forcibly dragged her to the site of the murder. They compelled her to look at a young girl's bloody, mangled, dead body on a dirt road. These townspeople created their own criminal justice squad, which overpowered Hannah and placed her under investigation for murder. She was jailed, convicted, and sentenced to death. Five months after the body was found, a crowd of locals watched as Hannah Okuish, the young, playful, precocious, brave, fearful, and loved child was killed publicly and hanged. She remains the youngest person executed in American history, and her conviction served as the foundation for the US criminal justice system. Hannah was a descendant and survivor of a history steeped in colonial violence. She lived and labored in Connecticut during a period of immense social and political change, the American Revolution, the displacement of indigenous people, gradual emancipation, and the start of the criminal reform movement. As a child of African and indigenous heritage, during the revolutionary and early national era, she experienced changing ideas of race, freedom, criminal justice, and childhood. And her case illustrates the barbarity of crime and punishment in early America, and also how emerging criminal justice was not just made up of lawyers and judges and officers. Criminal justice was the neighbors who gathered to arrest her, her family and friends who visited her in jail and fought for her release, the lawyer who represented her, the young preacher from Yale, Henry Channing, who made a name for himself by denouncing her at her execution, the witnesses who gathered at the gallows and told their friends, children, and grandchildren of the day they watched a child die. Criminal justice was formed from the sensational outcry directed at children like Hannah 
and tested by those who fought back. Even if they were not executed, African-American children and young adults, particularly those between the ages of 13 and 17, made up a sizable portion of the population in newly established prisons. Black children were not initially admitted to juvenile reformatories like this one, the New York House of Refuge, and instead were sent to adult prisons. They were sentenced in large numbers to prisons which became infamous sites of discipline and labor punishment, including New York's Newgate Prison and Pennsylvania's Eastern State Penitentiary depicted here. With Hannah's execution and those of other Black children that followed hers, the country established itself as violently carceral. No one under the age of 12 had ever been executed, and Hannah remains the youngest person to ever receive capital punishment. For Hannah and other Black children, youthful innocence of childhood could not protect them from the death penalty. And through these executions, the criminal courts devised new ways of dehumanizing Black populations beyond existing institutions of racial subjugation. By mercilessly imprisoning and publicly executing Black children, the justice system pushed the limits of what was deemed socially acceptable and criminally just. And dominant white society felt safe and powerful, punishing powerless Black children. Through these convictions, the system legitimized virtually any form of punishment under the guise of the nation's new project of justice and reform. Yet in condemning black children, the country's justice system condemned itself as violently racist and morally corrupt. Thank you very much. So now I will pass it to my colleague, Cabria Baumgartner, and I look forward to the conversation. All right, I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, thank you, Professor Crystal Webster for that powerful presentation. Um, and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to, to join you all. Um, a special thanks too to the American Antiquarian Society for inviting us to be in conversation um, this evening. So building on the work of scholars in the history of education and childhood studies, um, some of whom are uh, with us this evening, um, my research traces the African-American struggle for educational justice. So pictured here are the beautiful faces of black girls and women who were part of that struggle. And I asked myself as I wrote my book, um, what happens when these faces are put together, right, are side by side? Um, what do we see and what is revealed? And I noticed that these Black girls and young women set us on a path to achieving equal school rights. The Equal School Rights Movement began in the late 1830s and continued through the 1860s in states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. The movement's key principle was that all children had a right to a quality education on an equal and inclusive basis, regardless of race. So Black activists articulated this principle in petitions that they sent to state legislatures, in editorials published in abolitionist newspapers and at school committee meetings. Black activists in this movement pursued a range of strategies and tactics from boycotting so-called caste schools to filing lawsuits. Eunice Ross um, was one such young woman she was a young Black woman from Nantucket, Massachusetts, and she authored an equal school rights petition, which is pictured here on the right. 
And this petition was submitted in 1845 to the Massachusetts State Legislature. And in it, she proclaimed herself amply qualified to attend Nantucket High School. She had passed the entrance exam and she had completed the necessary coursework, but she was denied admission because she was black. So Eunice was asking the state, um, the state of Massachusetts, to protect not just herself, but all children in their equal right to the schools. And so after receiving this petition, it was sent to the state. Um, the town of Nantucket eventually um, integrated its public schools in the late 1840s. So we also see African-American girls and women's activism resulting in um, key decisions like school integration. So black girls and women like Eunice Ross were the catalyst for the equal school rights movement. They made sure that petitions were circulated um, and that um, signatures were affixed to those petitions. They made sure that meetings were organized and resolutions were passed. And they made sure that fundraising happened, especially when um, schools were boycotted. So this was arguably the first black educational movement in the 19th century and black girls took a leading role in that movement. When I see these black girls, I also am reminded of the disconcerting similarities between the 20th century fight for school desegregation and integration and the 19th century fight for equal school rights. And I say disconcerting because these girls and other children of color were fighting decade after decade after decade for educational opportunity, for educational access, and for racial equality. So here we see Linda Brown. Um, she's the third grader from Topeka, Kansas, who was at the center of the landmark US Supreme Court case, Brown versus the Board of Education. Um, of 1954. And we know there are other children who were part of um, this landmark case because the cases were bundled. In the center here, we have six-year-old Ruby Bridges from New Orleans. And then on my right here, we have um, Melba Patillo Beals. She was one of the Little Rock Nine. So there are more names, right? There are more experiences. And some, unfortunately, with some of these stories we just don't know um, because they've been lost. But those 20th century stories are connected to the 19th century. And we may not know the names of some of these girls pictured here, um, but I'll share a little bit about what I've learned in researching and writing about them. And I talk about them more um, in the book. So first we have Sarah Parker Ramond, um, she was from Salem, Massachusetts, and she was about 10 years old when she was expelled from her high school because she was black and high achieving. And that happened in 1834. In the center here, we have Maricha Lyons, who at 16 years old, delivered a speech before the Rhode Island State Legislature, pleading in her words, in a trembling voice for the opening of the doors of opportunity. And that was in 1864. A year later, um, Maricha Lyons became the first black girl to enter Providence High School. And there's a quote from her where she reflects upon this experience. Um, and she says, I had to sue for a privilege which any but a colored girl could have without asking. And then we have Josephine St. Pierre of Boston, who described the terrible verbal abuse that she experienced at a primary school in Boston in the 1850s. Um, she described being taunted, being harassed, and being called the N-word repeatedly. And this was a moment, these moments of verbal abuse 
um, she said, wounded her little heart beyond repair. When we think about historical continuity, racial violence also becomes visible. It feels like a straight line that can be drawn from 1834 when a mob tried to burn down a seminary for black girls and women in Canterbury, Connecticut, and that's depicted here on the right. And we can connect that moment to 1957 when the Little Rock Nine faced physical and verbal abuse as they desegregated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Melba Patillo Beals wrote about this in her memoir, Warriors Don't Cry, which is a book I highly recommend and I often assign in my own undergraduate courses. Um, in the book, Melba Patillo Beals writes, you'd be walking out to the volleyball court and someone would break a bottle and trip you on the bottle. I have scars on my knee from that. She was about 16 years old when this happened. Focusing on the 19th century, my book reads these educational narratives, right? The educational narratives of black girls as testimonies, not as singular, but in tandem, not as isolated, but as a collective. And in doing so, I think another very important theme emerges and that is black girls joy. These smart black girls expressed joy in learning. They loved books and they loved reading. They loved music and going to concerts and learning to play the piano. Um, they enjoyed learning languages like French um, and they wrote compositions, compositions that would then be published in abolitionist newspapers like William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator. They wanted to be part of an intellectual community and they wanted to live their purpose. And so in my book, I show how black girls and young women modeled this kind of purposeful womanhood, which defined kind of like being ambitious, but also resilient, um, being resourceful, being forward thinking, um, trying to navigate the oppressive forces um, that got in their way. And so there's something um, joyous um, in the work that these young black women did, even though they faced severe oppression. So telling these stories of black girls compels us to consider the consequences of placing vulnerable children at the center of causes of movements that really shouldn't require their presence. I can celebrate the fortitude and perseverance of black girls in this fight for equal school rights. I can certainly praise their activism in that movement and I do, but I also understand that I can place all of these black girls here, right, on this slide. And then there are of course those whom I don't even know because of the continuous denial of black educational rights in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and even in the present moment. The equal school rights movement is unfinished. And so when I see these girls, I'm reminded of my own obligation to carry on this fight. And to be clear, it's not a fight about critical race theory in schools. It's rather the fight for all children to have a fundamental right to a quality education on an equal and inclusive basis. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, and I'm delighted to pass the virtual mic to my colleague, Dr. Nazara Wright. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to be here. And I would like to thank the American Antiquarian Society for inviting me to speak to you today about the histories of Black childhood. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. OK, great. <laughs> Mm 
My entry point to this conversation is to discuss two autograph albums owned by Miranda and Sally Venning, two sisters raised in a Black family in Philadelphia in the 1880s. I will discuss three important points. First, the album's materiality. Second, how the albums reveal a violent family history. And third, how the Venning sisters secured networks in ways their grandmother was unable to generations prior. Born in 1862, Miranda Venning's album contains signatures from 1877 to 1886. Sally Venning was born in 1872. Her album commemorates her graduation from the eighth grade in 1886. The albums reveal one Black family's history of imagining freedom in the 19th century. Autograph albums originated in Germany in the 16th century. Girls often collected signatures during ceremonies like marriages and graduations. Their popularity peaked in the US during the Civil War. The materiality of autograph albums encouraged a girl's interaction with others in public. The albums were small and horizontal, often seven inches by five or smaller. Excuse me, Nazira. Yes. Um, would you like to share your screen so we can see your images? Oh, okay. I thought Can you Perfect. see the screen? Yes, that's great, oh. thank you. Oh, okay, I didn't, okay, great. Okay. Um, the albums are small and horizontal, often seven by five inches or smaller. The Venning albums are 145 years old, yet the paper is not brittle as is typical of paper made from wood pulp. The Venning albums are likely made with wove paper, a paper making technique invented by James Watman, born in Kent, England. Noted for its exceptional quality, wove paper, later called Watman paper, con contains fibers woven to create a strong, rigid grid. An edition of Virgil's poetry, Napoleon's will, Queen Victoria's personal correspondence, four of William Blake's books and the Venning albums were all printed on Watman paper. Illustrations of flowers in autograph albums served a pedagogical purpose. In The Art of Flower Painting in Watercolor, M. Thomas writes, quote, flower painting is a worthy occupation for the mind of taste. The efforts of the pencil have charms adapted to the hours of youth when every bloom conspires to, quote, wake the soul by tender strokes of art to raise the genius and improve the heart. I now turn to my second point. The albums provide a lens into the Venning's violent family history. Their story begins in 1815 when Miranda and Sally's grandmother, Sarah Martha, was born a slave in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. We know Sarah Martha's birth year because her age was recorded in the South Carolina death records published between 1821 and 1865. In February 1830, at age 15, Sarah Martha is sold to Richard Cogdell Sanders, a 43-year-old married bank clerk. Within 10 months, Sarah Martha was pregnant by Richard. Over the next two decades, Sarah Martha had nine more children. Only five survived beyond infancy. Richard also had two children with his wife, Cecile, therefore, According to census records, he set up Sarah Martha, his five children, and Clara, a nurse, 
in a house in Charleston, South Carolina. Sarah Martha died in 1850 at the age of 35 of peripheral fever days after giving birth to her 10th child. Peripheral fever is an infection of the uterus that develops within three days after childbirth and often led to septicema in the 19th century. We know only a few details about Sarah Martha as a person. We know that she mourned the loss of her babies. Cemetery subscription records indicate that she paid on time for a gravestone for one of her babies. When Sarah Martha died, the gravestone Richard Cogdell Sanders erected for her said, quote, she was loved by all who knew her for her gentleness of character. In 1850, the year Sarah Martha died, the US Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act. With one stroke of a pen, the Sanders children became much more vulnerable. Richard moved his five children from South Carolina to Philadelphia in 1858. He bought them a three-story brick house in the third ward at 1116 Fitzwater Street. Here are family members on the stoop. The 1860 census reveals Richard Sanders also moved to Philadelphia, but he lived in a hotel in the eighth ward called La Pierre House on the 100 block of South Broad Street in Philadelphia. When Julia Sanders marries Edward Venning, they have five children. Miranda is in the center and the youngest is Sally. I conclude my paper by examining the album's signatures. In 1875, at age 13, Miranda's parents sent her to Cambridge, Massachusetts to attend the predominantly white Washington Grammar School for two years. Miranda lives with Eleanor Jacobs, sister-in-law to Harriet Jacobs, author of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. In 1875, Eleanor Jacobs lost her husband, John Jacobs, who was Harriet's brother. The Vennings knew Eleanor, Harriet and Louisa Jacobs, who were running boarding houses in Cambridge. On March 7th, 1877, when Miranda is 15 years old, her uncle gives her an autograph book. On July 2nd, 1877, Miranda collected Harriet and Louisa Jacobs's signatures. Louisa Jacobs wrote, quote, precept is good, but example is better. A precept is a principle, often with some religious basis, that dictates how one should behave. Louisa encourages Miranda to make her own choices rather than follow empty maxims about morality. As Harriet Jacobs considered what to write in the 15-year-old Black Girls album, Jacobs likely cast her mind to 1828 when she herself was 15. That year, Harriet Jacobs was trying to avoid the sexual advances of her owner who refused to leave her alone. Jacobs writes about this difficult decision in her slave narrative incidents in the life of a slave girl. Quote, I was struggling alone in the powerful grasp of the demon slavery, she wrote. I was a poor slave girl, only 15 years old, end quote. Jacobs must have felt satisfaction and pleasure to see 15-year-old Miranda developing her intellectual capacities instead of trying to stop a sexual predator or manage pregnancy and childbirth against her will. Jacobs writes in Miranda's album, quote, trust and be hopeful. This message to a 15-year-old black girl has profound implications. Surely Miranda had read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl and had thought of her own grandmother who faced the same situation as Jacobs at the age of 15. And surely Miranda must have been mindful of the many contrasts between her girlhood and the girlhoods of her grandmother, Sarah Martha, 
and Harry Jacobs. The calculations and choices Miranda was making about her future were so different from the ones her grandmother and Jacobs had been forced to make. So when Harriet wrote of being hopeful in Miranda's album, she was transmitting the power of Black women's persistence and determination to young Miranda Venning. Miranda fulfilled her mentor's expectations. She was the first Black graduate of the Normal School for Girls in 1882. Her scrapbook indicates she became a teacher in Philadelphia. Miranda performed piano solos at, at recitals throughout Philadelphia. She becomes principal of the Joseph Hill School. And Miranda dies at age 38 in 1900. Signatures in Sally's 1886 album commemorate the end of her education in the eighth grade. One classmate writes in her autograph album, what is home without its joys? What are the girls without the boys? Another student named Stella writes, quote, to Sally, when you are old and cannot see, put on your specs and think of me. Another student writes a familiar poem, quote, roses are red, violets blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Poems with themes of hope, friendship, and love were inspired by popular manuals. Sally's diary reveals she worked as a tailor, went to church and the beach. She had a robust social life. Here are Sally and her friends on a hammock at 1116 Fitzwater. At age 31, she marries William Holden in 1903. Census records reveal Sally worked as a dressmaker and a homemaker. To visualize Black girls' movement, network building, and cultural activities, I developed Digital Girls Mapping Black Girlhood in the 19th Century. I transcribed autograph albums and organized research using Google Sheets. One click shows information on Miranda's performance at Musical Hall. Another click shows the actual building where she performed. The Vennings performed at the Natatorium Hall in Philadelphia, and here is the actual building that exists today. The Venning albums reveal evidence of intimate relationships. Each individual touched the album, flipped through its pages, read messages from others, and decided carefully on their own inscription. Thus, the albums help us think in recuperative, productive ways about touch and intimacy in the 1880s that moved beyond associations of touch with sexualized violence in the antebellum era. Thank you. So, um, Professor Baumgartner and Professor Webster, I am very excited to engage in a conversation with you two about your research on Black childhood. Um, and I have a few questions and I'm sure a lot of people would like to hear um, more about your exciting research. Um, my first question is, how do the stories and experiences of Black children challenge well-known or accepted histories and events in the 19th century? Um, I could go ahead and jump in. Um, so for me, it has been so illuminating to think about these intersectional categories, right, of race and gender and of age and um, and what that reveals. And it has been, um, to, to me, the really stark um, reality of criminalization for Black children when when we take those three things into account. So for example, when I'm looking at prison records and I see that there are a number of 
of um, people who are black and then even still a number more who are um, girls or or female and then a number even still more who are under the age of um, 18 black and of and girls so it just compounds so many of these um, different forces and really changes how we think about um, how we think about the history of prisons and criminal justice if we if we take those things into account and I think that folks who are doing this research we did not necessarily have the language and the tools and the resources but now we're in this really incredible moment where we have um, scholars leading the field like yourself and Sarah Wright and Cabria Baumgartner both of you um, who really give us um, some of the ways, many of the ways to unpack and um, and find these different histories and to, to do the difficult archival work of locating mm-hmm. Black children and by and saying that this is a category and, and an experience that deserves um, its own specific attention. Great. Yeah, I think that's a, um, those are really important points. And I would just say it, it if I'm thinking about this in terms of the emergence of public schools in the United States, I mean, I think that phenomenon is often depicted um, in sort of this really um, progressive way. Um, New England stands out usually as the leader in providing free tax supported public schools for children um, from the primary level all the way to the high school. And I think as my work shows and and other historians of education and um, your work and Crystal's work, um, it's clear that public schools and the public school system was undemocratic, right? Um, And that it often served as a battleground over these issues of race and gender. Um, And so it's not surprising that we see black girls and boys at the center of those battles really pushing the fight to democratize public schools. Yes, um, that's a great answer. Um, as I listened to both of your papers today, then I noticed that um, Black girls are representative figures um, that that kind of rep- are symbols for a larger political and social movement. So, for example, Cabrera, you said that the Black girls represent the, the first Black educational movement. And Crystal, you said um, that Eunice Brown, she is a representative of the criminal justice system and the first, um, you know, um, the first case where she was publicly executed. Um, So what are your thoughts on Black girls as representative figures for larger political movements? And does this still occur today? Do Black girls represent large political movements today? Go ahead, Korea. Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Um, <laughs> so I hadn't really thought about Black girls representing um, political movements, but I think your question is prompting me to, um, to think more about that and, and to, to connect that. I don't think, at least in the case of Sarah Parker Ramond, um, Rachel Lyons, I don't think they wanted or intended to be the face of the equal school rights movement. Um, they just wanted to go to school, right? Um, but ultimately, they became the face of the movement. Um, they sort of answered the call of the moment um, and took a lot, right? They, they took a lot of that weight and, and carried it with them. And I was thinking about the title of this conversation, Triumphs um, and Traumas. And there is a way in which we can say these Black girls were triumphant, right? Um, the work that they did led to legislative victories. Yes. Um, But then there's also the trauma uh, that these young, these girls carried with them into adulthood. um, And that's when they write about it. Um, They write about uh, this trauma as adults, as women looking back. And from those writings, it becomes clear to me that they never intended to be the face of the movement. Yes, yes. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think um, for myself, um, I really do see Black girls become symbolic, um, but not in the in a um, triumphant way in the in the kind of history that I'm telling. More in a um, 
a backlash and a fearful way of, of the potential of what Black girls can do and can mean for, um, for what America is trying to make for itself. What does it mean to have Black girls who can challenge white authority? Some like the most sort of vulnerable and the sort of least kind of political um, that do make these really important interventions on um, on white power and authority that then um, provoke such um, outrage and such um, fear and anxiety, which, as I'm saying, really becomes a foundation for justifying so much of what becomes terrible about um, criminal justice. And that absolutely resonates with today as we see the over-policing, the very violent policing of Black girls, the ways in which Black girls um, are surveilled um, in schools, the school to prison pipeline, as well as their experiences and treatments in the foster care system, and that there's this the, the direct connection between the two, right, that there's a kind of carcerality also um, mm. to these systems that still exist today. And I think um, in that way, Black girls become symbolic, but right in a, in a, in a, in a very, in a very violent way. Yes, absolutely. Um, one more question before we open the floor to the larger audience is what advice can you offer to scholars interested in recovering the histories of Black girls or Black children? Um, what are your research methods? So I can, I can start us off and then um, I'd love to hear um, both of your thoughts on this. Um, so in and I, I should say that I came to the study of childhood in a roundabout way. So even though I'm a historian of education, um, childhood wasn't a central focus um, in my earlier work. Um, and I thought actually the scholarship on the history of education, history of childhood should probably be better integrated. Um, and so thinking about some of the methods, um, I kind of adopted this black feminist approach um, in when entering the archive, which is the sense of being defiant and believing that I will find sources that in some way speak to the experiences of black children. They might not be the sources I immediately think of. It might not be um, a source that answers all of my questions. Oftentimes there are more questions raised than uh, we have answers, but um, it could mean going into an archive and looking at um, school records and looking at disciplinary records to try to understand how um, African-American children were perceived, how they were punished. This kind of goes back to Crystal's work. Um, and I've also looked at, um, at school records, um, curricular records, where you can actually see what children produced in class, which gives you some insight into what they're learning and how they're learning. And if there's anything in the margins, you can get a sense of the doodling that that children do. Yes, great. Yeah, I love that. I'm super influenced also by Black feminist and Black studies approaches of um, really drawing together a wealth of different types of archives to tell the stories that we need because they don't exist in one place. So I think a lot about the kind of ways that children move through the world, how they exist in all these different spaces, not really where you expect them to. Um, and so for me, um, space and cultural geography has been super helpful um, to reconstruct the world of children um, like I did in my talk today. Um, I don't have any um, information from Hannah about what that would have looked and felt like, but I do know um, what the what the world was constructed like, where she was moving, where she was placed, how far away she was traveling, even um, like how far her friends had to go to get to her to visit her in jail. Um, and then obviously like reading against the grain because the the archival record of that is is completely different than how I told it. Um, there's a lot, there's so much, so much um, condemnation yeah. in how her story is told. So really pushing back on those narratives. Great. Thank you all. Thank you for your for your answers and for engaging me in this wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank you all. Those are all three really, really wonderful short papers that uh, are leading to a lot of really wonderful questions that are coming in. So I want to get to these as quickly as possible, hoping that we can get to, to as many as possible. Um, 
Monica Flegel knows this is a fantastic panel. What theories, frameworks um, that historians have tended to use in the past perhaps do not do the best work when it comes to traumatic history? Any of you would like to address that? I think that's a that's a tough question, and in part because I, I mean, I'm someone who's building on the work of so many scholars, um, and in a lot of ways, it's other scholars doing this work. We're building on it, and we can push it further. Um, so I'm not. I don't know that I want to speak to maybe the the limitations of other scholarship as much to say how much um, scholarship now has allowed me and all, I think all of us to do this work. I mean, Azara's book came out. And that was sort of a revelation in a, lot of, in a lot of ways for me to think that it would be possible to write a book on black women's education. I mean, before her, we've got Linda Perkins and there are other scholars, Hilary Moss that have done work on the history of black education. So um, I'd like to speak less about limitations and more about um, those scholars who've paved the way for our work. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and, and you know, as I'm asking questions, I'm just kind of throwing them out there. So any of you can jump in and if anyone else wants to, to add on, uh, feel free to do so. And um, we've had some, some questions asking about emotional experiences. A lot of what you've been talking about is really uh, this, the, the trauma. Susan Bragg is asking, um, I'm very impressed with, with all of the, your work. Um, and she knows that she'll be thinking more about the issues raised well after this panel. But one issue that you all touched on but that I'd like to hear more about is the challenge or opportunity of exploring emotional experiences. Can you talk a bit more about the strategies for exploring girls' emotional experiences? I can yeah. um, I'd like to jump in really quickly to, um, to talk about that. Um, I really liked what, um, what was said today about Black girls' joy. Like, um, knowing that there are other types of emotions that we can think about when we, when we do research on Black girls in the 19th century um, without focus so much being on the bodies of Black girls, um, but more on their emotions and their friendships and, um, and these kind of feelings that they, that they probably had and that they most likely had. And so um, so these, so focusing on the interior, the interiority of Black girls is is what I really am drawn to, especially when I'm talking about these autograph books, because all I begin with is a book, a material object, and so and so I'll, the books have helped me learn more about writing and talking about girls' um, emotional state and and looking within and knowing that they had moments of joy and happiness, even, even during periods where the nation was, in, was at unrest. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question um, for Cabria. Um, what were the repercussions of the 19th century girls speaking out to advocate for equal access to education? Uh, Laura is wondering if there's evidence of violence or threats like what happened when schools were integrated in the 20th century. And you did touch a bit on that, but yeah. That... Yes, um, there absolutely were threats of violence uh, directed at black girls. Uh, one example would be the Prudence Crandall Seminary in Canterbury, Connecticut. Um, one of the first out of state students there um, was targeted by um, uh, the sheriff and she was there was a vagrancy law that was used and it was claimed that if she didn't leave the state um, she would be fined and she would be beaten so there were threats absolutely um, and still even after that moment um, she wasn't beaten but even after that moment more black girls still went to that school they still came down to Canterbury because this is something that they that they wanted um, I think in terms of other kinds of repercussions, what was really um, kind of saddening to see was in a lot of these fights for educational opportunity, the black girls who were at the front lines, who were on the front lines, never got a chance to go to the school that they were trying to get into. Um, these battles were protracted over years and you know their lives went on. And so a lot of them ended up, they, maybe they got married or maybe they had children or maybe they left the country. Sarah Parker Ramon ends up living in Italy. 
they do something else. And so they're actually never able to really go to the school that they tried so hard to get into. Others, but next generation could go, but those black girls on the front lines could not. And so that was, I think that is a repercussion. That is part of this story. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Manisha Senha comments, what a brilliant panel. Drs. Webster and Bumgartner spoke about the criminalization of black girls and exclusion from public education. I was wondering if Dr. Wright could talk more about the sexualization of black female children and the ways in which they sought to combat it. Thank you for that question. Um, well, in, in the research that I do on the autograph books, then I have an, an extended section on Sarah Martha, who was the grandmother of the vetting girls. Um, and so she was bought by um, Richard Cogdell Sanders. And then she, at age 15, she started having children by him. She eventually had 10 children by him. And so, so the sexual violence of black girls under enslavement um, is, is what we know about um, through slave narratives, like incidents in the life of a slave girl, um, um, and, and other types of histories that, that I've read. Um, and so, so yes, there's that history of sexual violence towards black girls, um, but, there's, but there's also stories about um, black girls who are thriving in Philadelphia. But, and of course, these are the Northern states um, and girls who are going to school, girls who are um, in Sarah Maps Douglas's school for black girls in 1834. Um, and so, and so writing, acknowledging that there is um, extended histories of sexual violence towards black girls, but also um, I want to write about histories where we learn about um, other types of ways that black girls move throughout the city, how they went to church, how they performed piano recitals all in the 1860s. Um, and, so, and so that's one way that I, that I show that Black girls are kind of combating this um, sexualization of their bodies. Um, but of course, it's largely contingent on geography and where they live, um, the opportunities that their family has. Yes. Uh, here's a question from Francis Foster that any one of you can, can jump in on. Do you see a role for published literature, poetry, fiction, et cetera, in your archival projects? Um, yeah, I'll just say um, very briefly, absolutely. Um, I think that that kind of speaks to a bit of the interdisciplinary work that I love to build, build into my projects, especially um, my first book incorporated a, a good deal of literature and material culture, which I think is a great way to get it, um, the voice and experiences of Black children. And then I also just wanted to say that the um, the text that I'm drawing on for this talk is also a rather literary text in that it became um, widely circulated, a quite sensationalized um, version of what happened. So there's also that piece to it as well, that it's not just that there are ways that we can understand historical texts um, that are about Black children as being quite um, literary or even creating a kind of sensational or mythologized version of what happened that we have to be very critical of when we engage as well. Um, also, I would like to um, respond to Dr. Foster's question and also say that Francis Smith Foster's research has been foundational to my own research on Black newspapers and archival work. So thank you for, for that, um, for the foundation that you provided for all of us. Um, and, and yes, I, I write about Teresa, a Haitian tale. Um, and I know, Dr. Foster, that you um, that you've written an article on this um, in African American Review, which I teach my students all the time. Um, there are short stories in the early Black press that are published. One by Mariah Stewart that I teach as well. Um, the first stage of life, published in 1861, um, in the repository that Black magazine. Um, and and so as a literary historian, then I write about our nag and incidents and um, the curse of caste by um, Julia Collins, um, understanding that there are 19th century novels, especially Francis Harper's, all of Francis Harper's work, um, 19th century novels that has that have helped me with my research on black girlhood. Um, and 
and that's led me to do even more archival research on this subject. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions left. I think we might be able to get through all of them if we if we move along quickly. I hope we can we can do that. Catherine Jones um, has noted, and this is a theme that has come up. Um, I think, and actually, in in all of her, your work, um, but this theme of historical continuity, uh, the sort of straight line that um, that Crystal uh, talked about as well. Um, but she's asking, you know, especially in Professor Webster and, and Professor Baumgartner's presentations, um, could you talk about how that theme inflects how you construct your narratives? All three presentations speak to the importance of how historians tell their stories. So if any of you would like to respond to that quickly, that would be great. I, I just wanted to say that I would, uh, if Crystal could, um, could respond and I, really like that she began her presentation by talking about a child-centered framework mm -hmm. um, and then provided this sort of luminous rich detail for understanding um, uh, black girls experience um, incarcerated so um, I, I would just love to hear more about that oh absolutely sure thank you um yeah, so for me, I am absolutely interested in the development of this, this system and how it changes over time. And I think in centering Black girls, um, we do actually get um, a much deeper sense of um, the development of the first prisons, for example, and understanding the direct relationship to these very public executions, and then the sort of concealed um, confinement of, um, of different populations, and also in particular of Black populations. So I think it really um, gives us a, sense, a clear continuity, but also really challenges and changes that continuity, right? It gives us just a deeper, uh, a more nuanced understanding of um, criminal justice and um, the carceral state. And so I think that it's so important to tell both that story, but then also like um, Dr. Baumgartner was saying, to really center um, black girls' voices and black children's voices, and to find moments of joy. So there's definitely that tension there that I'm working through. I've talked, or I've I've drafted versions of this talk and of this chapter, which begin very violently um, with the execution, and I've backed down completely from that. And that had to be a political decision that I made for myself. So it it is a tension that I'm I'm constantly thinking about. Mm. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to echo that. Um, I made a deliberate decision in, in writing the book to begin every chapter with a Black girl. Um, it's a very subtle thing. I don't know if anyone picked up on it, but um, it was something that I wanted to do as part of the sort of my ethereal voice to make sure that Black girls were, were centered. And I think that's very much why I um, like that part of your presentation, Crystal, that it was child-centered, right? At a moment that's so violent, that's so tragic that we're still um, thinking about the child at the center in, in Hannah. And so it's, I appreciated that. Thank you. Uh, more questions keep coming in. So I think I'm going to have to identify one final question. And then uh, the panelists have all agreed to address any uh, remaining questions um, after the fact. So we'll make sure these questions get to them and, and that, that you, they get answered. Um, so I want to just end here with a question from Lisa Monroe, who has um, each, uh, thanks each of you for your work. She has um, all of your books, so that's wonderful. Um, her question is, have you encountered evidence of how Black children, Black girls, countered or resisted anti-Black curricula or more generally demeaning representation of Black people, particularly in their recreation, games, songs, plays, or creative works? I would say absolutely yes. Um, and this probably um, fits with uh, the question that Professor Foster asked. Um, so I find that a lot of Black girls, a lot of Black teachers, Black women teachers, use their own texts um, to teach. And so Susan Paul um, used memoirs of James Jackson to teach. And this is a very positive sort of representation of almost a Christ-like child um, in James Jackson. He 
unfortunately dies at six years old, um, but she's using that book to teach um, literacy, but also to teach um, Christian ethics and principles. And so that becomes a teacher, that becomes a book that's then used in other um, classrooms by other teachers. Um, we have examples of um, Charlotte Fortin teaching um, about Toussaint Louverture, right? So we, we do, there is absolutely a black curriculum um, in, in schools where there are black teachers. Mm -hmm. And in some of the research that I'm doing on the Venning sisters, then Miranda Venning, she was involved in musical performances and she played the piano. Um, I looked in the records of Mother Bethel Church in um, Philadelphia, um, and it was just looking through their folders. Um, and you could see a lot of the musical programs um, and recitals that Black families um, put on like in the 1860s, 1870s. Um, and so, so I, I do think that even um, the in entertainment and, and that kind of livelihood, then it was very Black-centered as well. Well, thank you all so very much um, for this really great conversation and the, the wonderful presentations. And I'm sorry about going over, but I felt we, we needed to, <laughs> to uh, extend the time so that the, our audience was so engaged. This is great. And uh, we'll send the remaining questions to you for responses. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, and to let you know that uh, a little bit about some of the upcoming programs, next week's uh, program, which will be a hybrid one, um, is, uh, will be at 7 p.m. Um, a week from today by Robert Gross, a conversation about his new book, The Transcendentalists and Their World, and the week following on May 24th, also a hybrid program uh, featuring cellist Shirley Hunt for a special program on early 19th century performance traditions. So you can go to our website to learn about these and other programs in May and coming up this summer. Thank you all to again to our panelists and thank you everyone for attending and good evening. Great. Thank you. Thank you.